On this Thursday night, a long delayed commitment to justice for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. What's absent from the plan the Prime Minister calls transformative? I was a little disappointed. Plus, the class action lawsuit for reparations for the impact of residential schools, why the federal government is fighting it. What do you do about they put their lives on the line to help soldiers in Afghanistan. The Taliban gonna find me and they kill me. The dangers interpreters now face after U.S. troops leave. Return of the hug. The new rules Ontario's long-term care residents will soon embrace. And to boldly go where we haven't gone in decades. What NASA hopes to learn by venturing back to Venus. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with a number of threads about the treatment of Indigenous people in this country. The Prime Minister is promising transformative change two years after a report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls was released. In Ottawa, another tribute to the children found in unmarked graves in Kamloops. Whether it is residential schools or missing women and girls, Indigenous people have said for years the country's justice system is riddled with racism. We'll have more in a moment on the action plan unveiled today, but we begin with a class action lawsuit the federal government is fighting right now. More than 100 First Nations are seeking reparations for the impact of residential schools. The lawsuit alleges Indigenous communities have lost in whole or in part their traditional economic viability, self-government and laws, language land base and land based teachings. The government in court filings denies any responsibility. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, has our top story tonight. David? Well, Donna, in 2007, a settlement was reached that saw most survivors of residential schools qualify for payments out of a $3 billion compensation fund. But a few years after that, in 2012, two B.C. First Nations, including the First Nations in Kamloops, said that residential schools did not harm just individuals. The residential school system harmed entire communities. And so they sued and were soon joined in a class action lawsuit by other First Nations, now numbering 105 from across the country. Their common argument, the residential school system ultimately affected the entire community's ability to perpetuate their culture, perpetuate their language, or to do things like properly defend land claims. And the federal government ought to pay for that harm. How do you govern a community where nearly your entire population has had their children forcibly removed, not over one generation, but over several generations. And there's the disconnection from their language and their culture and their all of this. How do you address that? I mean, this is this is horrific. In court filings, the federal government acknowledges that, yes, residential schools were harmful and wrong, but as a matter of law, Canada did not commit any unlawful act that could be said to have harmed the bans. And in any event, the government says the harm suffered by First Nations over a century or more was a result of a whole host of other cultural, social, and economic factors. The parties have differing views on who is legally responsible to compensate for any harms caused by or through the creation of these schools. Now, some advocates and some parliamentarians say that the federal government ought to get out of court and sit down and negotiate these claims as part of the reconciliation process. No word today if, in fact, that is the plan for the Trudeau government. But in the meantime, these First Nations are preparing to go to trial, likely in the fall of 2022. Donna? All right, David Aiken in Ottawa, thank you. Now, to the promises made today about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The Prime Minister said voices have been heard and the government will spend more to support language, culture, infrastructure, health and policing. But critics say it includes no specific timelines and no details on how exactly the money will be spent. Abigail Beeman reports. We'll never be forgotten. Two years after an inquiry cited a genocide for Indigenous women and girls, a long list of partners presented a national action plan. We shine a spotlight on the immediate actions that need to be taken. We need accountability, inclusion, interconnectedness and concrete actions. 
The short-term goals are wide-ranging and include a guaranteed annual livable income, a nationwide emergency number and a 24-hour in-person support system, and a national task force to review and reinvestigate unresolved files. But there's no costing nor time frame for any of that. Then, confusingly, there's Ottawa's portion, a 30-page federal pathway promising more investments in language, culture, safety and justice. Many commitments are vague, none are costed. The minister in charge refused to be clear about whether Ottawa will implement those big-ticket national action plan items. I think what we are saying is that we support them, and now as we move to implementation, we obviously will will, um, be able to um, evergreen the pathway. This is our big concern and the confusion around, I think, this plan today. People may be under the impression that these initiatives that are being brought forth by the, the groups are actually going to be put in place and funded. It falls short from uh, what I expected. The document is a disappointment for John Fox Sr. His daughter Cheyenne fell to her death from a 24th story balcony in Toronto in 2013. He believes she was murdered. That's what's been happening with these with these issues with uh, missing and murdered women, girls, and um, they're just kind of being left on the back burner. Indigenous women and girls and 2S people are dying, and the work has to be done promptly. So, uh, personally, yes, I'm, I am disappointed that it's taken this long. Other stakeholders say they were left out of the whole process, while the Native Women's Association of Canada walked away from it earlier this week, citing concerns with the federal government's lack of concrete action. Now it says it will launch a human rights complaint and call on the United Nations to investigate. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Murray Sinclair, the former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, is calling for an independent investigation into unmarked and lost grave sites at residential schools. He told a House of Commons committee today nothing has been done on the matter since the commission released its final report six years ago. That is, he said, a sad commentary on the lack of commitment the government has to try to close the story of what happened at residential schools. We need to ensure that there is an independent a uh, study that is done into that question of those uh, burial sites. And that investigation should not be conducted under the auspices of the federal government, but, but should be overseen by a parliamentary committee uh, that will ensure that it is done in a, in a proper way. The last residential school closed in the late 1990s. The trauma, though, has not ended. The ripple effects have been pervasive across generations. Nithu Garsha is looking into that tonight. But it hit hard. It hit hard. A week after it was announced, the Kamloops residential school discovery packs a painful punch. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, we're all saying that as each day goes by, it's actually getting harder. Um. So, sorry. The executive director of Kikikyaka, Place of Belonging, says the child welfare system is failing Indigenous children, and this one-of-a-kind youth and elder housing facility is a solution because it promotes healing rather than perpetuating trauma that runs generations deep. The rates of homelessness, uh, chronic addictions, mental health, incarceration, death is... It, it's alarming. It's, it's, unex, it's just unacceptable. She says the government-owned 31-unit centre, which opened less than a year ago, doesn't have an age-out-of-care philosophy and ensures those living here are represented and remember their cultural lineage. First Nations people know what they need. They need to lead and develop their services. The children and grandchildren are at greater risk for uh, psychological dist- distress, so symptoms of anxiety and depression, compared to those Indigenous families who were not affected by the residential school system. Researchers at Dalhousie University have found there are biological impacts to a person's stress response system from trauma, which many of those living with it want to be trusted with tackling. We have the solutions, but the thing is, is we we didn't create this and it can't just be left to us to fix it all. And, um, you know, if there's a gift out of this, it's uh, those um, 215 little children, um, their lives have 
created this awakening. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Kamloops, BC. Now to COVID-19 and new attempts by the government to make people obey federal quarantine rules. Starting tomorrow, the fine for air travelers who refuse to quarantine in a designated hotel will increase from $3,000 to $5,000. Last week, a government advisory panel flagged major problems with the quarantine hotel system, including that some travelers choose to pay the fine rather than obey the rules. The panel calls for the government to scrap the hotels and instead allow travelers with a credible plan to quarantine on their own. Some long-awaited freedom is finally coming to long-term care residents and their families in Ontario. The province says starting next Wednesday, Wednesday, regardless of vaccination status, residents will be allowed brief hugs with visitors. If both the resident and the visitor are fully vaccinated, there can be closer physical contact, including hand-holding. And fully vaccinated residents will be allowed to leave their homes for day and overnight trips. Well, getting more people fully vaccinated is key. Manitoba is now offering a million dollars worth of grants to try to help. Community groups like religious organizations and sports associations will be eligible for the grants of up to $20,000 to promote immunization. 55% of all Manitobans have had at least one dose. We have to get past the 70% vaccination mark. We have to get to 75, then to 80, then to 85 and higher. Those numbers are achievable and necessary so we can get our freedoms back. Overall in Canada, 59% of people have had at least one dose and 6% of the population has been fully vaccinated. In the U.S., more than half the population is now fully vaccinated and COVID-19 case counts are down 94% from their peak. It is now back to where things were in March of 2020. That has prompted the Biden administration to look outside its borders. It's going to share millions of vaccine doses with the world. As Jackson Prosco reports, Canada is set to receive some of the U.S. supply, even as pressure mounts on Ottawa to share excess vaccine doses we have ordered with developing nations. Having come so far, the U.S. is ready to share its vaccine success with the world. Our overarching aim is to get as many safe and effective vaccines to as many people as fast as possible. By the end of June, the Biden administration will donate 80 million doses of vaccine to other countries. Of the first 25 million doses, 75% will go to COVAX, the global vaccine sharing program for developing nations. The other 25%, 6 million doses, will go directly to U.S. allies and partners, including Canada, Mexico, the West Bank and Gaza, and India. In many countries, the worst days of the pandemic are just arriving. Some developing nations still have not started vaccinating at all. And so Canada's inclusion on the U.S. donation list is raising eyebrows. Canada has secured more doses per person than any other than any other country. The world is watching us. There's growing pressure on Ottawa to give instead of take. Canada and the UK are the only G7 nations not to promise doses directly to COVAX. Canada instead purchased nearly 1 million doses from COVAX and received a loan of 1.5 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine from the US. We're calling on the government to announce that for every 10 doses given to Canadians, one dose is shared back with the developing world. To date, less than half a percent of all vaccine doses worldwide have gone to developing nations, a practice epidemiologists warn is scientifically unsound. If we want to be able to preserve the effectiveness of the vaccines that we have currently now, we want to reduce the amount of time that this virus is circulating globally. Key to the U.S. dose donation strategy is that the vaccines are being given away without any conditions on the countries receiving them. That's a model the Biden administration is likely to push during next week's G7 summit. Donna? All right, Jackson Prosco, thanks. That sinking feeling coming up, the massive sinkhole that keeps expanding. It is already huge, about 60 meters wide and 15 meters deep, and this sinkhole in southeastern Mexico keeps growing. It appeared on Saturday. Owners of a nearby house say they heard what sounded like thunder. Now their home is on the verge of being swallowed up. 
A growing controversy about Air Canada is not disappearing. It's emerged the airline paid about $10 million in bonuses to its executives while negotiating a federal bailout. All those opposed to the motion will please say nay. Carried. And today in the House of Commons, there was a vote, a unanimous one, to condemn Air Canada's senior management. The Prime Minister calls the decision to pay bonuses unacceptable and has asked for an explanation. New Brunswick is creating a committee to try to diagnose a mysterious neurological syndrome in that province. Doctors formally identified a cluster of patients with an unusual combination of neurological symptoms in early 2020. At least 48 people, ranging in age from 18 to 86, have the disease, and six have died. The committee will review case files and interview patients in an effort to identify what is making people sick fearing for their lives. Interpreters in Afghanistan who help Canadian soldiers now need our help. In 100 days, American troops pull out of Afghanistan and left behind will be hundreds of interpreters who work closely with soldiers, including Canadian soldiers. They would have been lost without the interpreters. Both the UK and the US have expanded their plans to get those people and their families out of the country. As Mike Armstrong explains, they fear the Taliban is coming for them. They were there in Afghanistan, just about any time Canadian troops went anywhere. Sometimes interpreters wore slightly different uniforms. Sometimes they wore Canada's. My interpreter was, was my lifeline. And Dave Morrow served in Afghanistan as a military liaison between civilians and soldiers, a job he says would have been impossible without interpreters and their knowledge of Pashto and Dari, two of the local languages. Their men, Morrow says he trusted with his life that as soon as the U.S. leaves, the Taliban intends to kill. The country is, is falling quickly. And uh, it's only a matter of time before everybody that worked for us is, is going to be a target of their, uh, of their attacks. What are you hoping the federal government does? Well, I'm hoping they do the right thing. Morrow is part of a group calling on Ottawa to bring interpreters to Canada basically before it's too late. With the U.S. pulling out, an already desperate situation is about to get worse. There are reports since 2016 about 300 interpreters who worked with NATO forces have been killed. In recent weeks, interpreters have held rallies calling for help. They say they're already getting threats from the Taliban and have to live on the run. Because if I stay in a place for like one month, two months, three months, the Taliban are going to find me and they kill me. Now, Canada did have a program to relocate interpreters and their families. About 300 people were brought over, but that program expired in 2011. We know we have a special obligation to these individuals. With the U.S. pulling out, Washington is looking at expanding its program, while the U.K. created a new one in April and announced last weekend it's speeding it up. We think it's the right thing to do to stand by these people. They, they sacrificed a lot to look after us, and now we're going to do the same. In my opinion, they've, they've served with the Canadian Armed Forces. Morrow is still in contact with his interpreter in Afghanistan. It's someone he always promised would someday move to Canada and someone this country, he says, has a moral obligation to help. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. A planet too mysterious for just one mission. Next, NASA's big plans for Venus. Well, the Concorde is history, but there's another plan for a plane able to fly from New York to London in three and a half hours. United Airlines has ordered 15 supersonic jets from a startup company called Boom Supersonic. They say it will fly at twice the speed of today's fastest airliners, and they'll run on 100% biofuel. It is still just a plan. They haven't been built, and they still require government approval. It's hoped they'll carry passengers in 2029. And this is Venus. We're going back there. For the first time in 30 years, two NASA spacecraft will venture to the second planet from the sun. The goal is to investigate the mysteries of Venus, including whether it was actually the first habitable planet before Earth. Eric Sorensen takes our deep space dive tonight. It is shrouded and mysterious. Venus is similar to Earth and passes closer to our planet than Mars ever does. Yet it's the neighbor we mostly avoid. 
A Soviet probe 50 years ago took rare pictures from the surface. The probe was crushed by the atmosphere within two hours. But now NASA is going back to have a closer look for the first time in 30 years with two missions, Da Vinci to measure the planet's toxic atmosphere, Veritas to map the planet's surface. We hope these missions will further our understanding of how Earth evolved and why it's currently habitable when others in our solar system are not. Venus might once have had oceans, then turned into a seemingly uninhabitable environment. But Venus may well have been very habitable, comparably placed to the Earth. And then things began to change. So how Venus got to its current state is really very important to our understanding of planetary evolution. Venus and Mars are our closest neighbors. Temperatures and the potential for life depend in part on orbiting distance from the Sun. Venus is closer and hotter, Mars further away and colder. But it's not just location, it's atmosphere. Mars, smaller, with a weaker magnetic field, lost most of its atmosphere. Earth has a more hospitable atmospheric blanket that makes life possible here. While Venus is enveloped by dense gases 90 times heavier than Earth's, a super greenhouse effect that makes Venus so hot. It explains the interest in Mars, where probes and landers can exist for years. On Venus, they would melt. But there is so much to learn from Venus that's possible now. It's exciting for all of us because it's been um, a lot about Mars and very little about other planets. Modern instruments will be able to penetrate the dark mysteries and reveal even simple facts about Venus. Does it have volcanoes? Does it have valleys? What does the surface of Venus really look like? Recent findings suggest that that thick atmosphere might harbor microbial life. Other scientists are doubtful. These missions that start in 2028 will answer some of those basic questions about our neighbor. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Thursday from here on Earth. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this family of geese in Riviere des Mille Îles, Quebec. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Farah Nasser will be here at the anchor desk tomorrow, and I'll see you on Saturday for the new reality. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.